Three Hours in Paris actually is set in 1940. And what a shift to do that after, you know, with a successful, you know, New York Times bestselling series to go and do this standalone. Could you tell us about the book, first of all? And I want to show you the lovely cover. Um, I love this cover. It was designed by Janine at Soho. I think she outdid herself. And it has a luscious map of all the places that Kate Reeves, the protagonist in my book, goes to in Paris. It's a 1940, it's as accurate as we could get it. And many of these places are still there. So next time you go to Paris, you can find them. But, um, and I walked and biked all these routes. So, um, and I took the bus. But so for the past 20 years, I have been writing the Amy LeDuc investigations. Um, and, so I have to go to Paris, you know. I know it's a tough job, but I had to go and do research. And then when I get there, I talk to uh, private detectives, fleeks, the cops, the cafe owners, the bus drivers. Um, I got to go under undercover with an undercover cop in Pigalle, the red light district, and go mm -hmm. into the different clubs. I get these incredible experiences. And also, when I'm there, I'm uncovering bits of history because Paris is, as you know, layers of history. <laughs> and what I found is there were all these bits and pieces about recent history, World War II. And they were things that I kept uncovering these stories during the Nazi occupation, stories about quiet and not so quiet acts of resistance by ordinary Parisians. And I've seen the bullet holes in the prefecture walls. I've touched them, um, you know, during, from the fights during liberation. I've seen the German graffiti in, in the shelters underneath the Jardin de Luxembourg. Um, and I really wanted to bring that to life because I felt it, it had so many stories, but they did not fit in my Amy LeDuc stories. And so I just filed away these tidbits. Now I have, I'm going to reach down here. I have many, many, many notebooks over the years where I'll write down a conversation or uh, something that I see or something that I read. Hmm. And they didn't go anywhere. I couldn't shoehorn them <laughs> as I would have liked to in the Amy LeDuc books. So one day, and I couldn't get them out of my head. So one day I stumbled across this strange factoid. It's really a footnote in history that Hitler came to Paris for three hours after the occupation, only three hours. Why? And he left abruptly. Uh, I thought, why would that happen? He fancied himself an artistic man. He was a failed painter. He knew and memorized the layout of the Paris Upper Garnier. And it was, this was sort of the jewel in his empire, you know, the jewel in the crown, because Paris was an open city. It was an open city, so it wouldn't be destroyed. And it was almost empty. And I thought, why would he have spent three hours only in Paris? Why no victory parade on the Champs-Élysées, right? What if something happened? It was well, only two weeks into the occupation. So he exactly. should have been just like riding very, very high, but something happened that day <laughs> and it was up to you to imagine it. And then the other thing that, that I understand that you found out is that before Britain had its famous OSE, you know, the, what, the office S -O -E. of- SOE, yeah. SOE, the SOE, there was something else. Tell us about that organization and how the novel's protagonist, Kate, fits into it. Sure, the SOE, Special Operations Executive, um, was mandated by Churchill to set Europe ablaze, but that was later. That was about August, September of 1940. We have this very uh, strange time when there was a lull because Churchill only became the prime minister in May, and then there was the fiasco at Dunkirk Churchill needed a win, okay? He needed something because, you know, everyone thought, and there were plans for the Germans to invade England. And there had been this underground, well, not underground, it was formed, it was called Section D. And I found out about it because these um, papers had become, you know, they were released uh, 
what is the term when they've been under you know, for 75 years, they've been under lock and key, they were um, allowed. Censored or something for a little while, Cla classified. Declassified. Declassified. Thank you. De thank you. <laughs> declassified. And they were declassified at, at, the, uh, at the Imperial War uh, Archives out in Kew Gardens, which is way the heck out of London. Anyway, that was, but they became uh, open and here was this uh, avant, this kind of seat of the pants organization. All their actions were deniable. Many of the people uh, were inventors. They were people from foreign countries and they would go and do unsanctioned, uh, not sanctioned by the military um, operations in Europe. They would do sabotage. They would do assassinations. Who's that? Okay. And, um, so that group was very seat of the pants. They were not part of the old boy mm -hmm. network and they were really looked down upon. And so I thought, well, they would recruit someone. Churchill needed a win. They would recruit someone who would go and, and uh, you know, possibly do something. And who would they recruit? They would recruit a woman who was, had nothing, to live for. I mean, I could talk about Kate Reese, but that's where my American Please. protagonist came from. Who is Kate Reese? Where was she born and how did she get the skills that the, the British government would trust her to send her over to try to assassinate Hitler? Sure. Mary Vollmer's trying to get on, so I hope she finds the streaming link, link but um, sorry, Mary. Um, so Kate Reese, I wanted an American woman who um, I thought she at first she would be from Montana or Wyoming, and but she wasn't coming to me and let you know maybe Sujat did because I've never been to Montana or Wyoming, mm -hmm. but but I she came to me when I was on book tour in Oregon mm -hmm. because I knew people in Oregon I'd been there a lot and I met a friend who Maureen who runs the historical society outside of Ashland, and I was talking about I really wanted to find a real gutsy character and she said come and meet some of these women whose ancestors settled or the, the valleys in Oregon who came over on the literally frontier wagons, covered wagons. And those are a lot, kind of a lot of the people that are in Oregon, and I mean, some of them. And so I thought that would be her. And these are women, these are ranchers who, who um, and my own mother grew up during the depression. And I know it was a tough time, but just think if you grew up in the depression in rural backwoods, Oregon, on a ranch, your father was a migrant ranch foreman, and uh, you had to deal with the weather, you had to deal with snowstorms. If there was a, a, you know, a tear in the fence and the cattle were getting out in the middle of a snowstorm, you had to go stop it so you wouldn't lose the herd. Um, you know, the tractor tires could blow out. Um, you know, the cattle had to be fed. Um, and she would, you know, she learned that you needed to do that. And she also learned to shoot because she needed to protect the, ra the ranch from feral animals and hunt for food. And I thought that's the kind of woman. And then she, she is learning French because she grew up with five brothers. Now, I think growing up with five brothers, you could probably handle anything. But after that growing up with five brothers, her father sent her to her aunt's place and she ran a rooming house in a small town in Oregon. And in this pension, in this rooming house was a French woman, a war widow, a, a war bride from the First World War. And she, she just transfixed Kate because she wore lipstick. She drank really strong little cups of coffee and Kate learned French. And uh, got a scholarship and went to France. And in the summer of 1938, before the war, which started in Europe in 39, she met, uh, she met a Welshman, fell in love. Uh, they went back to Wales. Uh, he was commissioned in the army and they were sent to Orkney Island, uh, way up in Scotland. And they had a baby. And Kate was working in the munitions factory he was uh, you know, working in the military, and this was a very strategic point of the Orkney Islands. So there she is, and for Kate, she, was, she loved it because it's such a wild islands if you've been to the Orkneys, you know, and you've got the prehistoric monoliths, 
and then you have the, oh, the sound of the ocean all the time. And yet it's very strategic military, militarily wise. And when something happens and there's a Luftwaffe bombing, she loses her husband and child. I don't want to say too much, but mm -hmm. she has nothing to yeah. lose. She has nothing to live for and she gets recruited yeah. by Section D. Yeah. One of the things that's very effective for, in the novel, I think, is you have these two viewpoints. You have Kate, who's got her mission, and then you have someone in the German military government, you know, somebody in the police who realizes there's a threat to Hitler who's trying to catch her. And so we get to go into his mind too, into the mind of Gunther. And you have said that Gunther is a um, homage to um, Philip's um, famous, the Bernie Gunther book by, yeah, Philip, by Philip Kerr. And so I wonder, do we have any Philip Kerr fans on the, on the call today? I, I bet we do. And I've missed those books so much. And those are so rich in their depiction of World War II Germany. And you're doing that with World War II France. But tell us more about your character, Gunther, and, and you know, his role in the book. Well, thank you for bringing that out. Yes, he is an homage to uh, Philip Kerr. Um, but I knew, of course, that a, um, there would be someone after Kate, um, and he would be a German detective who has, uh, is on um, Hitler's, uh, what do you call it, his, his crew for personal protection, and in the security service. So his own life is on the line. He is given 36 hours by the Fuhrer to find the assassin, the attempted assassin. And so I didn't want him to be a cliched Nazi. I wanted him to be, um, give, have dimension, not to be a caricature. He needed to reflect the moral complexity of what people did during the war. Because as you know, good people do, can do bad things. And I really wanted him to be someone you could empathize with, not his task, not the fact that he, um, you know, he worked in Nazi Germany. And he has a stiff teddy bear that he's been trying to bring to his daughter's second birthday the whole time, but then he's pulled to go to Paris to find the assassin. And he's got the you know, the stiped teddy bear in the briefcase, you know, and he's always thinking he can, you know, bring it to his daughter. And, um, and uh, so I think uh, a lot of us know Aunt Ag Agatha's bookstore in Ann Arbor, Robin Agnew, uh, wonderful, wonderful bookseller. She asked me some questions and she said, was that a, a you know, asked me about the stiped teddy bear to make to make Gunter human. And I said, well, Gunter is a human being, you know, he doesn't like being a Nazi tool. And he also has his own code, which I think every character in the book, I hope has their own moral code. It may not be my moral code or your moral code, but they need to do what they think is right to get the job mm -hmm. done. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And there were a lot of power plays within that Nazi group, just as there were power plays within the British government that you know, Kate is working with. And then within the resistance, there yeah. are all these people that are double agents. Um, so there is a lot to follow going on. It's like a breathless pace. And I <laughs> wanted you to read a little bit, just like this tiny little bit that I thought I wanted to discuss with you. Remember we were talking about that? Yeah. Okay, so. So Sujata asked me to read this, and I'm just going to start right in. So this is when Kate is recruited, and um, she has signed the Official Secrets Act. She doesn't really know what she's getting into, but now Stepney is who is her handler and recruited her is explaining. Stepney cleared his throat to get her attention. We have limited time, Mrs. Reese. Please listen closely and try to remember everything I say. If nothing else, remember these letters, R-A-D-A. -A. He gave her a half smile. No, it's not the Royal Academy of Dramatic Arts, but that will help you remember. Burn the letters in your brain. Make them second 
nature. Rada, read, assess, decide, act. This stands for read the situation, assess possible outcomes, decide on options, act on your decision. Can you repeat this? She did. Voila. I love, well, first of all, I love your style of writing. You're these short, brisk, staccato sentences that I just pay so much attention to them. And I think it really lends itself to, if you are in this suspenseful situation, like she is, like she, she's almost killed in every chapter practically, or she <laughs> has to narrowly get away. I mean, and she has all these wonderful disguises and twists and turns. And so she really has to do that. So not only have you explained that to us, but she does that. And I also think it just means a lot to me because I feel like in my life now, I have to rada every time I leave my house. I have to decide whether I, I can, I have to, if a person's getting too near to me, or whether it's like, do you, it, it's not about like looking cool anymore, you know, and just like acting like you don't know what's going on. It's like, we have to make all these decisions about everything. So I just, I thought that was a really good um, code to live by. Thank you. Yes, we can all rada, you know, especially yeah, we have to do that. six feet apart and, you know, yeah, <laughs> sure you're, or you're just, spraying the packages. And right. The like and, one of the things is in California, I think that your governor is really ahead of things. And I think that he said something like you all shouldn't go shopping for two weeks. Didn't he say something like that? So it's like, yeah. well, if that's what they're doing in California, I should probably not go shopping for two weeks, even though nobody's saying that in Baltimore. But really? yes. <laughs> I think we have to wear masks too. I think that's the law. I don't know. You that's know your I mean? law. Yeah, we don't have that law, but we should be yeah. doing it. Yeah. Well, I we have got so many people chatting on the side that I was hoping to 58, 58 participants at least. Wow. So can we get to some of these questions? Um and um, I don't know if they're going to always just remain in the chat or whether people are going to be able um, to go. This, sorry, Alexa from Soho here, the silent but not silent anymore moderator. I would say we actually haven't had any questions yet, a lot of comments. So if anyone has questions for Kara or Sujata, please go ahead and ask them in the chat. Can I show this picture too? I forgot to yeah, show do that. that. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Okay. So here is a picture of Hitler in the middle with Arno Brecker, his, um, his, the sculptor of the Third Reich, and Albert Speer, do you see on the other side? Okay, this was during the three hour visit to Paris. You can watch the visit on YouTube. Both of these men, right? After the war, uh, Speer served time in prison. Uh, Brecker was eventually rehabilitated. They both wrote memoirs or recountings of the time and talked about this visit to Paris. <clears throat> well, Arno Brecker said that it happened on June 23rd after Hitler signed the armistice up near the uh, Belgian border. Albert Speer, in his recounting, said it happened a week later on a Sunday morning. Both men were there. Both wrote different accounts with different dates. That also made me think something happened. Because who was a minister of propaganda at that time? The pioneer of faux news, Joseph Goebbels. Okay, so we can thank him a lot for some of our faux, you know, <laughs> the techniques that are used today for propaganda and faux news. And uh, Joseph Goebbels was the one who was saying in April of 1945, when the Russians were entering Berlin, he was making the last news real. Ah, the German army is victorious. Um, so. That's the kind of man who edited the film of these mm -hmm. three who went to Paris. So, so I we have a question from the author Naomi Hirahara. How was it for you writing from a male point of view? Was it fun, a challenge, liberating? Um, I found it, uh, I really liked it. I mean, Gunter really came to me. I didn't feel um, so much. Uh, I didn't feel it was a stretch. I hope he's believable. I just thought of him as a family man who wanted to get home for that chocolate cake for his chocolate daughter's chocolate birthday. He had the gift. 
then he has to go and work like any parent. Um, but I really wanted to show what I felt would be um, the male view. You know, he grew up, Gunter grew up during the, um, the what is it, the uh, Weimar Republic which was, you know, people had no money in Germany. They had to put Deutschmarks in wheelbarrows to bring it to the bakery to buy bread, this inflation. So he grew up in hard times. And for him, his uncle was a policeman. And then when he joined the police force, there was order, there was stability, there was a way to get things done. Mm -hmm. And Gunter, to me, Gunter is that kind of a person. Um, so I felt, I, I sort of approached it from that point of view. Another thing about him that I just remembered is, doesn't he say that, well, he, he thinks his sister had a relationship with somebody Jewish and the police know it. So he's always under pressure that they could do something to his family. Exactly. And that Thank makes you. Him yeah. Especially like he's going to just do his job. Um, he's not going to do it bad. He's not going to do anything corrupt, but he's going to do his job because he's, a, he's afraid. Um, and there are a few situations like that of other characters in the in the novel that have a connection that are trying to suppress it because you know they don't know what's going to happen next. Exactly, which is how it how it was in those days. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So you got a, some question here. Is it difficult to write about a different time from the Aimé Le Duc novels, which those started? Did they start in the the eighties or the nineties? The Aimé novels. They started like 1993, mm -hmm. so um, okay. we're up to, maybe the next book will be 2000. Mm -hmm. You know, actually, I don't know if I, I can't remember if I talked about it, but I would go to the flea market and I would find these photos, okay? Can you see that? Photos like this. Look at this, mm -hmm. look at Paris. It's kind of like Paris now, <laughs> empty. Mm -hmm. Here's another one. Uh, look at this, the Champs-Élysées. This is 1940 and there's a caption on the back. You know, here he is directing traffic and there's no traffic, but it's, it's like today, there is no one out and about. Um, look at these people. Look at these two women, one is knitting. I found these in the flea market and they were just like a treasure because I could talk about, look at this woman's fur coat and she's mm -hmm. waiting in the train station. I could see how people were dressed. You can get the feeling. And here are women, um, this is very close to my friend's apartment up in Montmartre. I don't know if you can see Sacre Coeur behind it, but look at what it was like when you had to go out and get water, when you had no running water inside. So I, I get a lot of help from photographs and I think about how it felt. I mean, look, can you imagine? But of course there are good, good photos like at Liberation, right? Where we have people mm -hmm. that are enjoying. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> that one really cracks me up. You know, to me, he looks like that policeman on the Friday Fisher murder mysteries. You know, that young policeman who goes with Dot? I just think he's, he's cute. <laughs> he's cute, and he's got the free French right there. So, yeah, yeah there were good so times, cute. too. But, um, you know, there's these wonderful atmospheric photos here. This young woman had to make a, a phone call, and she they had no lights because of the blackout. She had to use some special coupon de courant or something, you know? Mm -hmm. So there's all these things and it's about describing them. I read a lot of fiction uh, written at that time as well, uh, discussing, you know, everyday life during the occupation. Uh, so I, you know, especially by primary sources. So I found that really helpful, which makes me think, I know lots of people in Paris, my friends are keeping journals of every day of the pandemic. So. <laughs> It'll be interesting to see, you know, when we finally get through this, what it's going to look like. Yeah. How we'll look back on it. Mm -hmm. So Rachel asks, what is it like trying to write strong moral characters dealing with the complexity of these situations? This is dicier than the Amy books, if you ask me. Yeah, well, I think, um, I think the stakes were very high at this time. And again, as you were talking about, Kate really doesn't have a lot of time to think. She's trying to escape and, and um, you know, not be caught. Um, but I think it's important to talk about different points of view. And I think a, a lot of people, we have secrets, we keep things to our chest. Um, and if we were caught in a 
bigger picture and um, that we would have our typing our own oral code. I don't know if I'm answering your question, but I think in wartime, you have difficult decisions. Good people make bad choices and bad people can sometimes do good things. You know, it's not black or white and you're in a heightened situation too. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So someone was asking, Karen is asking, do you read any diaries or journals or like what are some of the written sources that you looked at? Exactly. Yes, I did. I have read, I went to the archives in France. I looked at the archives and the Imperial War Museum in London and then outside at Kew Gardens. And yeah, there are recountings. People talk about this. Um, I got to look at the section, some, some, not a lot, of the Section D declassified um, uh, pages that were left of some of the um, SOE, uh, Special Operations Executive. And you can read about that, you know, things every year, every couple of months, new things are being declassified. So you can read what people talked about. There's lots of things written about them as well, especially the SOE. And of course, we know Susan Elia McNeil, her Maggie Hope, she's mm -hmm. SOE, but this is pre, this is before it. So yeah. I have a little more leeway because nobody knew a lot, but I do read primary sources. And in France, I've been to the military archives out in Vincennes, um, the Chateau de Vincennes, and reading about, you know, you could see, read a police blotter about this day in Paris, mm -hmm. uh, you know, what was happening, you know, how many bicycles were stolen. But they didn't put how many Jews were taken from the apartment building. And they so, also didn't write how important women were in this fight. Right. How important they were in the resistance, how important they were as collaborators, like what all the roles that they played. And I think, didn't you say that many women went to their graves not telling people the brave things they did? Oh, yeah, yeah. There was a woman who died in, I think, Bristol um, in 2010, or uh, I'm not sure exactly. And uh, the neighbors realized she had died. Um, they went into there and no one uh, knew her. She, you know, she'd always kept to herself. Nobody thought she had family. They didn't know anything. They were going to bury her in a pauper's grave, mm -hmm. public cemetery until someone, you know, the police looked into the, you know, bureau like your, and found the Croix de Guerre. You know, mm -hmm. and the British, you know, and this woman had these incredible honors and, and medals from World War II. Never talked about it. No one knew. And then they mm -hmm. found out later, looking at the SOE archives, who she was and what she had done. And she had been this woman who spoke part French. She was in, uh, worked as an undercover agent. And then she was taken to a concentration camp, Ravensbrook, and actually survived. So, I mean, there was this whole other thing. But she, t you know, she took that oath never to talk about it. Mm -hmm. And she was of that generation that they took that to the grave. You know, those stories didn't come out. Uh, of course, people, you know, uh, people now wish they had known. Mm -hmm. But um, so there's a lot of stories about women. There's, I knew a French resistance woman who's almost 100 now, still alive, um, met her for coffee. She was a young woman in Lyon. Her father had a printing, uh, printing press, printing company. And she would, uh, you know, take his orders on the bike in the basket, you know, to hit the printing jobs. And she had a toddler. And one day, her father said, please deliver this. And she had no minder. So she brought her toddler on the bike with her eggs and went to deliver this. Well, it turns out she was delivering the package to the Maquis, which is a French resistant in the countryside. It was guns. <laughs> mm -hmm. And I said, oh my God, what did you think? And she said, well, I'm glad I didn't know um, <laughs> what my father gave me. But again, I said, weren't you worried? Weren't you scared? She said, you know what? Who's going to stop a woman with a toddler on her bike and a, you know, a bag yeah. of eggs? So, yeah. I mean, you know, there's so many stories like that. Yeah. But they were brave. I mean, they were brave. They, they make, you know, they don't make a lot out of it, but they did what had to be done, right? Wow. Well, we're ready for just a couple more questions. Um, we're we're kind of getting close to the end of the hour. So I wanted to see what else do we have? Okari, is this a new direction in your writing? Do you think you're going to continue doing more with, you know, French modern history or, or what, what's next for you? Well, I'm working on the next Amy Leduc. 
Um, and as soon as I finish that, yes, I'm going back in time. I think I'm really interested in a story mm. about uh, post-war France right after the liberation. And I'm very interested in Amy's um, grandfather, Claude, who we have met in other books, Murder mm -hmm. on the Game. Everyone loved Claude. Um, and I did too, a bon vivant, you know, he had a mistress, he was telling, he loved art, he cooked, appreciated good wine. Well, his mistress, Amy never wanted to know about her grandfather's mistress. And I thought, what is her story? So I'm thinking of, <laughs> I'm flirting with the this idea of Amy's, uh, not that Amy would really be involved in this story, but where her, her grandfather Claude's mistress came from. Oh, I know that mistress. <laughs> For one of the books, it's like, I don't right. exactly, like she really, she really captured my mind. Oh, so, oh, that's a great idea. Yeah, well, I just feel so lucky that we're friends, you know, we, We've normally oh, in the yeah. past, you interviewed me when I was, you know, talking about my first Indian mystery, The Widows of Malabar Hill in San Francisco at your neighborhood bookstore. And then, where I would, year, yes, Bookshop West Portal, where yeah, I, yeah, Bookshop West the, Portal, and yeah, then where I would be doing my launch tonight, but. yeah, yeah. And then but, also, yeah. we you came to Washington, DC, which is not that far from Baltimore. And so we spoke together at the Politics and Prose Bookstore. Then we had a wonderful Italian meal afterwards. So oh, fantastic. we're in these separate places, but we're still together. And we're, we're with a great publisher that lets us write these feminist mysteries set way out in the world and <laughs> different time periods. And we can take these risks. And I feel really lucky about it. And also... Before we sign off, I want to encourage, if there's anybody out there who is a writer, I want to encourage you to go for broke during this time. You will never have this length of time again. Like I remember when I started writing, I was living in Japan and I didn't have to work, you know, for whatever reason, my husband was in the military. I was alone. And so I did all this writing because I was alone in the house and I would not be where I was today if I didn't do that. And there are a lot of, wouldn't you say there are a lot of resources online right now, Cara, for- Oh, more than writing. before, yeah. I there's didn't know that story about Ray Shimura. I love I loved those books. Story but. contests and yeah. you know, there's just all kinds of things that people are wanting you to write now. So if you if you read, but you really want to write, just 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 do it, just do it. And it's it'll take your mind off things. Right, so, right. It'll, you know, give yourself a goal. I don't know, you know, 200, yeah. whatever, however many words a day. That's what I'm trying to do, right? Okay. Well, I think we should all toast Cara before we sign off because... Well, can I toast you? Thing. And can I toast Sujata for helping out here? And I want to toast everybody at Soho, Alexa, Stephen, yeah, absolutely. my and your editor, Juliet, Paul and Rudy and Bronwyn, who is the helmswoman of our ship, Rachel, Janine, mm -hmm. who am I forgetting? A lot of toasting. I think there's a lot of people. I don't necessarily, I'm going to see if there's any glasses in these pictures. But yes, there are. Vincent has his glass up. Oh, yeah, lots of people. All right. have Marianne, okay. Marangela has a glass up. Yeah, a lot of people. Yeah, lots of people have their glasses and it doesn't matter. You know, it, we're all together. Thank you so much, everybody, for coming out. I apologize for our technical difficulties. <laughs> so I think everybody's online tonight, basically. That's the problem. So, we'll do better next time. Yeah. Well, we're either reading a book or online talking to an author, right? So, okay. Thank, Thank you, everybody. You so much, everybody. Thank you again for joining us. And happy reading, Three Hours in Paris, out today. <laughs> I hope you enjoy it. Thank you. Okay. Good night. Bye.